Buenas tardes. Soy Rubén Vigil, jefe de prensa de la Fundación Princesa de Asturias. Bienvenidos a la rueda de prensa que van a ofrecer a continuación la profesora Kathleen Carico y los doctores Drew Weisman y Philip Felgner, Premio Princesa de Asturias de Investigación Científica y Técnica. Este año, por segunda edición consecutiva, las ruedas de prensa son de carácter telemático a través de la plataforma Zoom. Recuerden que para formular sus preguntas pueden levantar la mano físicamente o bien utilizar la aplicación que permite la propia plataforma. También nos pueden enviar sus preguntas a través del, del chat de, del servicio de Zoom. En primer lugar, los galardonados les dirigirán unas palabras y a continuación abriremos el turno de preguntas. Gracias. Cuando quieran. Uh, I'm, uh, Philip Felgner, and, uh, from the University of California at Ir Irvine, and uh, well, it's a very thrilling uh, opportunity for us to be here and to uh, join our colleagues that have uh, experienced this uh, really uh, spectacular uh, su scientific success that has to has matured over all these years, and. Um, I'm just looking forward to taking your questions. I am Kotonin Koriku. I am a biochemist by training, and uh, I, uh, I work together with Drew Weissman in the uh, University of Pennsylvania for many years, and the last eight years uh, working at uh, BioNTech in Mainz, Germany. And I am very happy to be here, humbled and deeply honored to receive the award and uh, unbelievable attention, what <laughs> can I say? And uh, yeah. so I am looking forward to answer your questions. I'm Drew Weissman from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Katie and I met there 20, almost 25 years ago. I'm incredibly honored to have been selected for this award with these wonderful other recipients and the incredible treatment that we received so far. Thank you. Abrimos entonces el turno de preguntas. Sí, Sara. Eh, buenas tardes, Sara Álvarez de Europa Press Asturias. Eh, ¿creen, que, ¿Creen que es oportuno que en países como España se esté administrando una tercera dosis de las vacunas? Mientras en otros territorios el porcentaje de aplicación de primeras y segundas dosis es muy inferior. Gracias. So, we've been fighting for vaccine equity for many, many years, even before COVID-19. And you're exactly right. Until we get the world vaccinated, we're not going to get this infection under control. Now, it's true that a third boost, a third vaccination, is needed to obtain a high enough level of immunity to give protection against COVID-19. But we can't forget that the rest of the world needs to start their vaccinations, or this epidemic is not going to get under control. Yeah, I, I would agree with uh, Dr. Weisman and uh, confirm that. Uh, but uh, also, the, the manufacturing of the product is not really the problem. But it's uh, political and uh, distribution. Some things are, are totally political, or, and others, other factors are uh, just a matter of making the vaccine accessible around the world. And so those are problems that uh, we need to uh, get uh, solved at this uh, stage. But I might say the production and scale up took time and then, so it is uh, one reason because it, all of a sudden you cannot make that much, but uh, I am sure that uh, now it is uh, getting better and better and, <clears throat> and more place will be made. and. And of course, we would like everybody to have all of them, not just first, second, third dose. We would all want to do that. And actually, we drew, you remember that we developed, when we developed and worked with the RNA, we always 
thought about that how good because it is easy to make yeah. and cheaper and and we wanted to make it accessible for everybody that's why yeah at the beginning we were working and thinking like that but i think that for hopefully not soon we'll get another uh, viral infection and but by that time i think that the whole world will be more ready mm -hmm. <coughs> Siguiente pregunta, por favor. Nos llega por correo una, una cuestión que plantea ¿en qué otros campos de la medicina podrían aplicarse los avances logrados en la molécula de ARN mensajero desarrollados para la COVID-19? I might say that uh, actually other fields started to use the messenger RNA before it was used for vaccine. And uh, the first uh, project was by AstraZeneca developing for heart failure. And this is a phase two trial already when uh, messenger RNA coding for a, a protein which makes new blood vessels, BGFA, mRNA is injected to the heart and many other, other fields. So passive immunization, messenger RNA coding for antibodies is already clinical trial, and messenger RNA coding for different cytokines in uh, clinical trial for uh, cancer treatment. So it is just, the possibilities is just unlimited. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I, I remember back 20 plus years ago when Katie and I started working on RNA, we would sit down and just write out all of the possible things that RNA could be used for, all of the diseases, all of the therapeutics, and the list just kept going on and on. So now that there's clinical trials for new vaccines, there'll soon be clinical trials for genetic therapies, for in vivo gene therapy, for all sorts of therapeutics, uh, you know, the, the, the landscape is just vast. And I think that uh, sometimes when we uh, talk about this time uh, in our uh, scientific history and uh, technology development, it's referred to as disruptive technology because uh, everything is being done faster, better, and cheaper. And uh, that's one of the things that's happening now, it's happened before. Uh, if you want to think about examples, we had uh, monoclonal antibodies that there were no monoclonal antibodies at one time, and now it's the most active area in pharmaceutical uh, uh, development. And that's uh, the kind of thing that we're uh, seeing right now with messenger RNA. Más preguntas? Doctor Felgner, recibimos una para usted. Es pionero en la utilización de microarrays. ¿Podría explicarnos brevemente en qué consiste de una forma que el público no entendido eh, sea capaz de comprender su aplicación? Well, they're used to measure the antibody responses that are induced by either infection or vaccination. And we were really privileged and thrilled to be poised at the very moment that the outbreak was evident because we had a coronavirus uh, protein microarray avail available that uh, could measure 80, 88 different respiratory virus uh, infections uh, in, at one time. And we had uh, developed this platform and probed uh, Orange County, California 10,000 samples, and we were watching the development of herd immunity in, um, in uh, Orange County when the vaccine got introduced, and we had 6,000 people in the hospital get the vaccine within three weeks, and we, we, we saw the, the tremendous increase in the antibody response in that population. The first time point, it was up to 80% after six weeks, and we didn't believe the result. We thought it was, uh, it was a mistake somehow. 
And we waited for the second time point before we convinced ourselves that it was a really great thing. And um, it, was, it was a thrill. And we're glad to be here to tell you all about it. Más preguntas? Doctor Weisman, ¿nos, ¿nos podría explicar las ventajas que tiene una vacuna basada en ARN frente a una con virus inactivos? Sure. So I think first you have to understand what mRNA is. So our, the, our DNA encodes all of the proteins that allow us to live. In order for a protein to be made, the cell makes a copy of a DNA code with RNA. That RNA is then read by a machine called a ribosome that produces a protein based on that code. So it, it's kind of the middleman. The way the mRNA vaccine works is it supplies the middleman, it supplies the RNA code that a cell takes up and then produces that protein. The body recognizes that protein as foreign and makes an immune response against it. So there, there are enormous number of advantages of RNA. Number one is probably the speed. So with an inactivated virus, you have to isolate the virus. And then you have to grow it up, and you have to learn how to kill it. With RNA, you just need the sequence of the protein of interest. And since we've been studying coronaviruses for decades, we knew what protein we wanted. So the minute the sequence was out, it took us hours to start making the RNA. So speed, the, the ease of production is, is enormous. With RNA, you use the identical lab setup for any coding sequence, so any vaccine. And it's a very simple procedure. So the, the, those are the main things for a pandemic. It also turns out that the vaccine is very potent. You get antibody levels five times higher than a convalescent patient, which is very potent protection. And it's incredibly safe. A billion people have been vaccinated, and, and we haven't seen any serious adverse events. Gracias. Más preguntas, por favor. Si no hay más cuestiones, yo le voy a plantear a la profesora Caricó una desde la Fundación. Esta mañana ha tenido la oportunidad de visitar un colegio aquí en Asturias en el que han estado trabajando y estudiando su trayectoria y su obra. ¿Cómo ha sido la experiencia con, con los niños? Sí, por supuesto. Conocí a los niños en Twitter y en Facebook. Uh, in March, and uh, they had this uh, uh, International Women's Day celebration and the science celebration, and they selected me to investigate. And, and of course, it was very exciting today that um, I could meet them and talk to them and try to encourage them to be a scientist. And uh, because I remember when I was a student, I also, we also had in school visitors, scientists, and, and uh, I, I remember even today that how excited I was. And uh, so I am hoping that one or several of them will be scientists because we need the younger generation and we need more scientists. Mm. Muchas gracias. ¿Hay alguna pregunta más? Si no hay más preguntas, damos por finalizada la rueda de prensa. La siguiente tendrá lugar a las 5 de la tarde con Gloria Steinem, Premio Princesa de Asturias de Comunicación y Humanidades. Gracias.